There we go. Okay, sorry. I had a bit of an issue uh, getting my screen to uh, stay horizontal. It kept wanting to go portrait mode. And that is not going to work for a screen like this. <laughs> uh, so we're talking about templates. I'll wait for a couple people to join the stream. Uh, we had to, I had to restart the stream. And uh, yeah, so I'll let, the, let a couple people join and we're going to talk about mixed templates. Say hello when you arrive in the stream. We got one viewer so far. Okay, we'll wait for a couple people to come back. I apologize for the uh, technical difficulty there. I'm going to wait just another minute and we'll get started on mixed templates. Great. Great to see. Glad it looks good. Yeah, I don't know what that was about. It's very strange. Okay. Um... We're going to talk a little bit about mixed templates, what they are, how to set them up, why they're cool, and uh, I'm just going to do something really quick, and we should be golden. Let me see here. So that is a little bit of an annoyance there. Hey, Simkey, thanks for joining. Appreciate you being here. All right, so I'm going to move these down. Actually, I'm gonna do this over here, I believe on the sends. I mean on the inserts <laughs> over here. That's probably more effective for me to do it here. Hey, that says three people on my end. <laughs> it was shameful at two, but man, we got three now. We're we're doing we're doing great. <laughs> yeah, the uh, I'm, I'm, uh, the the YouTube streaming thing is very new to my channel, and I haven't announced it really that any to anybody that I'm doing it. I just kind of started doing it as like a beta test. Um, so yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not expecting tons and tons of people to watch it, but I am gonna save this clip, and uh, people will be able to watch it later. Okay, so I'm just going to do a couple of little cleanup things that were bothering me. And we're going to get to explaining this template. Some of these effects I've had for a very long time. So long that they did not adjust to the new uh, number of inserts in Nuendo. <laughs> and I have to move down my uh, pre-post line, which is very, very small. There we go. Okay, so basically a mixed template. We're going to talk about what they are and how I set mine up. Now, I am not advocating being lazy by any means. And mixed templates are not really about being lazy or pre-mixing sounds, right? They're not about, say, setting up a chain for your kick drum necessarily. 
or setting up a, tr a chain for your vocal even, um, they're a little bit more about setting up an organizational structure and a general sort of big picture uh, bus structure uh, for your mix. And this includes grouping as well as some basic general effects, but it also includes your aux effects or your effects tracks, delays, reverbs, things like that. Um, and I'm really a big believer in templates, and I have a lot of different templates, I, but I have one for mixing, I have one for um, basically every type of job. I have one for mixing, I have one for editing, I have one for... Um, let's see here. I'm going to move these down as well. I have one for editing, I have one for mastering. Um, this is something I've been meaning to do. I have one for uh, just tracking, which is empty. I have one for my podcast. I have, you know, you can make as many templates as you want pretty much for th different types of projects that you do. Um, now, for my mixing template, basically, I don't have any audio tracks in here by default, um, really. I just have uh, a couple of empty ones, uh, and I'll explain what those are for. Just got to move a couple of these things down. This is something I've been meaning to do for a long time. It's a very, very thin line here. Come on. Nope. Almost done with this, folks. Just a couple more. So, uh, first things first. I run my sessions most of the time at 48.32. So by default, I have my session set at 48.32. Now, there's nothing wrong with 44.1. There's nothing wrong with 88.2 or 96K. Um, I have good luck running 48.32. I also have good luck running 88.2, 32. Um, I just have done it for a long time. Uh, I think 44.1 is on its way out to some degree. Um, as streaming takes hold, we actually do have the opportunity to uh, not be confined to the CD standard anymore. You know what I mean? There's no re real reason to uh, have a CD standard if CDs aren't sold anymore. Right? So, um, yeah. So, uh, let's see here. We got all my delays, got all this stuff. All this stuff is set at zero. I've got my group tracks. Everything is set at zero. I've got my output buses. I've got my master. Okay, so here we go. We're going to get started. Uh, I'm going to probably move my camera just a little bit closer, so hopefully you guys can see things a little bit better um, and tilt it up a little bit. Uh, in fact, I might even... Well, we'll get there if we, if we need to. Okay, so this is my mix template. It is empty, there are no audio files in here, and I have everything in folders, so when I open it up, it looks like this. It's very clean, it's very simple, uh, and this actually opens up over here. And so, first thing first, I have two audio tracks in here. I have a mono, an empty mono audio track, and an empty stereo audio track. Um, I will get to that in just a second. Basically, I only do this because um, the way that you drag files into Nuendo or Cubase, um, it's just a little easier if you have a track here. A lot of times, too, uh, I open up this template when I am starting to work with a band. So um, I'll open up this, and the first thing that we record when we start working is a scratch track or a demo. So I'll put the demo on the stereo track or whatever, or in a scratch track. Um, or if it's a mono track, maybe it's just a guide or some sort of click or something. You know what I mean? So I like to have those in there. I can easily just grab it in there and drag in a demo, drag in a click track, drag in a, a vocal scratch, something like that. Um, so I use this template for recording as well sometimes. Um, but I also will use it for just mixing. Uh, so I like to keep two audio tracks at the top, a mono one and a stereo one. Um, it's just handy. Now, let's talk about my groups. So I always start my session with the same groups. And 
do I always need these groups in my mixes? No. Do I usually need more groups than this? Yes. Um, but these are generally something I'm going to need. And those are, in order, a mono lead vocal track, which is blue, a stereo background vocal track, which is light blue, a stereo acoustics bus, uh, which is brown, a stereo electric bus, which is green, a stereo percussion bus, which is gray, stereo drum bus, which is dark gray, stereo, or sorry, mono bass bus, which is purple, and uh, stereo keys bus and stereo synth bus, which are red and yellow. Now, I work on a lot of different kinds of music, so sometimes this completely changes, and I need four synth buses and a synth bass bus and uh, and no guitar tracks, you know? Um, sometimes I'm working on a pop song and it has, you know, background vocals, but it also has oohs and ahs and it also has like ad libs, you know, so I definitely will have to update some of these, but it is handy to have them. Um, for example, let's say I have two sets of drums on a song. Well, I already have a couple of plugins on my drum bus. So I can just duplicate um, this drum bus and I have an identical copy of this. So I at least have something to start with, right? It's not just nothing. Um, and I color code things this way every single time. That's another big thing I would recommend doing um, is creating systems for yourself, creating whatever they may be, whatever color coding system you want to use, whatever naming scheme you want to use. Just create a system and stick to it. So, for example, um, my lead vocal is always track one. When, when the session is all done, eventually it is track one. And my lead vocal bus is always this color. And my lead vocal track is always that color. Now, if it's a female singer, I will often go to a pink uh, or light pink or a sort of red, uh, light uh, kind of uh, salmon red color, light red color. Um, but... Uh, if it's a male singer, I'll go with this dark blue. My backing vocals are always this light kind of teal color. My acoustic guitars are a brown color or a tan color. My electric guitars are always some shade of green. My drums and percussion are some shade of gray. My bass is always some shade of purple. My keys, and that includes like uh, electric keys as, as well as acoustic keys, um, are always some shade of red. My synths are always some sh shade of yellow. Um, so you get the idea. I keep a consistent thing. And it always, um, I also have decided in recent years to, uh, to move these up. Because usually the very last thing in my session is bass. The very last audio track is bass. So I organize my buses the same exact way I organize my session. It's usually lead vocal, backing vocal. And then main instrument, whatever that may be. So that could be keys, it could be synths, it could be guitars, whatever. Um, I just have these alphabetical acoustics, electrics, keys, synths. Um, and so it depends on whatever. So the main instrument would be next, and then the secondary instrument would be next, and then percussion, drums, bass. In that order, every single time. Every session I've done for the last 10 years has been done that way. And it's always been these colors. Now, um, I have a couple extra buses here and a couple extra, one, one audio track. So let's talk about these. I have a print bus, a print track. We'll talk about that in a second. And then I have an all vocal bus, which comes from my, I'm going to enlarge this so you can see. Uh, the all vocal bus comes from my lead vocal bus. So my lead vocal and backing vocal bus are outputting to my all vocal bus. Okay, all vocals. And then my all music bus is coming from my acoustic, electric, keys, synths, percussion, and drums, and bass. Um, so those all go to the all music bus. And these two vocal buses go to my all vocals bus. And then all of my effects, which are in orange, all of these go to my all effects bus. So why do I do those three? Um, one reason is because sometimes you'll have uh, you'll need to do a mix with um, no lead vocal or no vocals. So you need to do an instrumental, boom, render. That's all you have to do. Okay, you mute this, it mutes the other tracks, 
you're good to go. Um, sometimes you need a vocal upmix where all the vocals come up. Well, what if all of your vocal tracks have tons of automation and stuff like that? All you have to do, plus one dB. Vocal up mix, okay? Or a vocal down mix. You could do minus one dB. Um, all music, same type thing. Let's say you need one where the music is ducked. Okay, minus six dB. Let's say you need one where it's vocal only. Delete, mute, uh, mute the music. See how in Nuendo, at least, when I do the all music bus, it mutes all the things that come before it? Um, so, this way, I can very easily create alt mixes. The all effects bus is really handy because sometimes either the artist or even the mastering engineer will say, the whole song just feels a little bit dry or a little bit wet, and you can adjust all the effects up and down. Now, of course, it won't adjust any effects that you have on tracks as inserts, but it will affect the one as sins. So you have to think about that a little bit. Um, it will only affect your send tracks. Um, sometimes I will add a drum crush bus to do a parallel compression with the drums. Sometimes not. Um, and then at the very end here, I have all my effects. We're going to go back to the print bus here in a second. At the very end, I have all my effects, which I have 24 effects set up, which is a lot of effects, I know. Um, and I'm going to go through all of them so you can kind of hear each one. And then I have some uh, actual hardware buses, and these go, these are routed to uh, different places on my patch bay, okay? So my alternate out is just uh, my outputs three and four. So my main mix goes to outputs one and two, which is my master here. My alt out is outputs three and four, so that allows me to go out of that into another. Um, uh, another interface, another computer, if I need to go onto the patch bay, if I want to send that to a uh, piece of analog gear, bring it back in on the patch bay, and then do a quick AB. I mean, there's a lot of reasons I could need the alt-out. Um, sometimes the alt-out goes to a separate headphone amp. I need it for a separate headphone mix, you know. And then I have bus A, B, C, D, E. These are five stereo buses that I use for sending things like maybe drums or uh, maybe I'm using them for a reverb send. Um, but the point is they're already set up and ready to go. So if, for example, uh, this was my like my lead vocal track, um, let's say I needed to I wanted to send this to an effect. Okay, well by default, uh, I have my effects all here. But I can also send to a group, and I can also send to an output. So I could send directly to my master, my alt out, my bus, my bus B, my bus C. Um, you know, so I have all that stuff already ready to go. It's already set up and um, and ready. That's why it's handy. Okay. Now let's briefly talk about the print track and the print bus. So this is something that can come in handy in very specific situations. Let's say I used three microphones on a guitar cabinet. Now, there are some situations where rendering those three down to one track or render in place or commit function or any of those could be the best way to go, the quickest way to go. But sometimes I find that it's actually quickest just to route it to a bus, uh, in this case the print bus, and then record onto a print track which is already routed from the print bus. Okay, so this is recording the output of the print bus. So all I have to do is send my guitar tracks down to the print bus and then render from the print track. Um, so that can be sometimes the quickest way to go about it. Um, it just is. Now, this is this one is set up stereo, and I've debated doing a stereo print and a mono print. Um, you can think of them almost like a summing bus, right? Like a little... Um, like a little, uh, you know, analog summing device or something. Uh, let's see here. Uh, stereo...
I think I will make a mono one as well. So how I did that essentially is I made a mono audio track and I made a mono audio bus. And I'm gonna call them mono print bus and mono print track. And uh, stereo print bus and stereo print track. So now if I need to render something or sum something very quickly, that can be the way to go. So all I have to do is send those three things to mono print bus, hit record on this, and go for it. And I'm already summing. So that's a very quick way to do that. Um, and like I said, sometimes it is quicker just to to render it and go. But I find that one thing that's annoying is sometimes with the rendering, you have to disable a bunch of effects and all kinds of stuff like that. With this, you don't have to do that, okay? Because you can just send directly from the channel. Um, uh, what was your comment? So you have this as a normal project. Oh, or saved. So it's saved as a template. Yeah. So just like in Pro Tools or any other program, um, I save this as a template. Like I have, you can see, I have a lot of templates here. Um, I save this as a as a template as my mixing template. Um, when I just open up Nuendo, I don't even remember what the default project is. Uh, I never, I never do that. I just open everything from a template, either an empty template, or and I recommend even doing templates for your empty sessions. And that's because in templates, in most programs at least, you can define things like uh, your organization and your layout and certain preferences. Um, it's just kind of, it's just better, I think, to have a template for everything. Uh, let's see here. So I'm actually going to put these... in their own folder. Should I do that or should I put it up here? And the question is, should I put them up by the other stuff or should I put them down in their own thing? Hmm. That is a good question. I'm gonna get rid of the mono print bus. I just don't. I just don't really think I'll need that because I could always just use one side of the stereo print bus. You know what I mean? Stereo print bus, stereo print track. If you have an all effects bus, what's it used for? Okay, so there's a, like I said, there's a couple reasons you might need an all effects bus. Like every now and then, um, you will be asked like in a mix to, it's like the whole thing feels a little bit wet or maybe it feels a little too dry and they want more effects. And all you would have to do if you wanted more effects um, is uh, turn up that all effects bus. Um, sometimes you need to quickly mute all of the effects so that you can hear something dry and you could just simply mute that uh, or in this case mute that and it would mute all of your effects um, you know, there's a couple reasons it could come in handy. 
at the very, I mean, it doesn't take any CPU to have your all effects bus. Um, you know what I mean? It's empty, so it's not doing anything but just chilling out. Uh, most of the all effects, the all music, and the all vocals are more just for convenience. I don't usually process them, per se. Um, every now and then, I'll put something across all the music or all the vocals. Uh, every now and then. It's pretty rare, but every now and then I will do that. I feel like I should do a different color for this. Yeah, you could also do that. Um, if you if you do a lot of automating on the effects returns, um, or let's say you need to cut off all of the effects quickly and you don't want to automate it on five different effects, all you could do is automate... I could automate this bus muted on and off. You know what I mean? It'd be very simple. Like like I said, it's more just for uh, because it can come in handy, not really because I particularly really need it. You know what I mean? But it definitely could come in handy for certain things. Um, the all vocals and all music definitely come in handy as well. So, uh, let's see here. What else? Um, what else do we have? What else do you have? We got to print tracks. Okay, so we're gonna, and then I have my master bus, which I don't need reading automation right now. Have the master bus, and by default, my master bus plugins, as of this moment, are a Chandler uh, curve bender doing just a little bit of top end. It's hardly doing anything. Um, I do have it set in mid side mode. And then the SSL uh, G bus compressor, which I have set to about 80% mix. And I do have a little bit of the sidechain filter. I keep my, um, my headroom knob down. I don't want it to be crunchy. If it's not this, I really like Cytomics the glue. I really like the UAD 2500. I really like the 33609. It, it just, sometimes I don't use any bus compression. You know, it just kind of depends. And I'm usually not doing much, okay? I'm not one of those people that slams the bus compressor. I usually, like, tap it, like, 2 dB type thing. You know what I mean? Maybe at the biggest part of the song, it, it goes up upwards of 3 or 4. Maybe. But usually it's, like, 1 or 2. Just barely gluing. And not only do I do 1 or 2, I'm at 80% wet. Okay? So I, I was really not doing a ton. And then I have a... Um, UAD Ampex 102. And I have this set pretty clean. I'm not doing tons of saturation on this either. Um, I even have the bias curve set very clean where it's not doing lots of, like, EQ. Um, I think it's doing a little bit of a low bump and maybe a tiny bit of a high bump or a high roll-off. But I tried to purposely set this fairly flat um, where I wasn't really doing anything. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm even going to compare, actually. I kind of made a preset for this. Uh, where is it? I think it might actually be my default one. Yeah, it's my default preset. Okay, good. So I have this clean master tape. Um... this clean master tape preset that I made that's pretty clean. I mean, it doesn't do a lot of saturation at all. Um, yeah, so that's, I like that. And then at the very end of my master bus chain, I like the Waves uh, PAZ analyzer. This is not a very accurate analyzer. But I'm used to seeing it, and every now and then it's handy to check. It's especially handy to check if um, I'm trying to get just in the ballpark of like, okay, am I like mixing this song way too dark, or am I mixing this song way too fat, or something? Again, it's not very accurate, which is kind of why I like it, because if it was super accurate, I would look at it all the time, and I'd try to mix with my eyes, you know what I mean? 
but I keep it set very generally. I keep it very sort of, and just kind of almost look at the curve more than anything. Like if I see this being like super like, like that, I'm like, okay, I'm mixing this song way too dark. Or if it's like tons of low end out here, I'm like, all right, I'm, this is almost just like a, a helpful hand. Um, I don't use it a lot. I check it, you know, early on in the mix, maybe sometime in the middle, maybe at the end. You know what I mean? Um, I don't, I don't leave it on like some guys do. Like I don't always check it. It's just handy to check every now and then. Um, and that's pretty much my master bus. Uh, let's see here. What else do I have? Um, I wanted to just briefly go over all the effects that I have. I'm just going to use a guitar to demonstrate. Um, I'll use something a little more percussive. I think that would be helpful. Okay, so let's go in line. Uh, I'm going to start with ambience. I'm going to turn these up pretty high so you can hear them. This is dry. Ambience. So that's like modeled after that live room. Okay, it's about 0.6 seconds of reverb. Then I have bright studio. It's similar, but it's wider and it's a little bit longer. So that one's got a little bit more pre-delay. It's darker, um, and it's about the same length as this as the Bright Studio. That one is about a second and a half, and it's uh, sort of balanced. It's not particularly bright, but it's also not what I would call dark. Um, so that's just kind of like a large room. That's what that's called. I have drum plate, which is really aggressive and percussive and nice and nice and uh, sort of splatty. I don't know how well this is all coming across from a guitar or how well it's coming across on YouTube, but you get the idea. Here's a spring reverb. Not the most realistic spring reverb, but I like it. Let me see if I can adjust that a little bit. I bet I can make that sound a little bit better. Ooh, that was loud. <laughs> that was a very loud sound. All right, we'll just let that chill out for a second. <laughs> okay. need to get the update of this plugin. This is a very outdated version. <laughs> um, yeah, that sounds a little bit better. The other thing, as you notice here, I have my peak hold set to hold forever. So I don't know if you can see these, but I have these little green peaks that go through here. And I'm not changing my send level, but I want to make sure that my effects are all coming through around the same level. That's very handy when comparing two reverbs, because otherwise you'll think the louder one sounds cooler. Here's dark verb. I love that reverb. It's thick, very thick and dark. Okay, I'm going to move over here and compare both of these side by side. Okay. Uh, next is Vox Plate. So this one is very sort of light and airy. And 
and I've got a little bit of mid side EQ on this one too. So I'm actually pulling down some of the mid channel uh, here uh, to allow for the vocal to be a little bit cleaner in the middle and the side EQ uh, is not being touched. Let's compare here. I'm going to plug in my phone very quickly because my battery is dying. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Hopefully everybody's, uh, this is all coming through and making sense and everything and people are enjoying this. Did that actually work? I don't actually know if that, that worked. Let me do this. Well, hopefully that's charging my phone. I guess we'll find out. Okay, here's an EMT 250 plate. I like the way that sounds, but I have wanted to swap that out for one of the UAD plugins. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that actually. Um, That's nice. An EMT 250 plate. Like it. Uh, what do they have for the preset uh, pre delay times on there? I'm curious. 20, 40, and 60 milliseconds. So I have it set to zero because I have my pre delay already set on here um, to 60 by default. Uh, let's move on. I have medium hall. Love this reverb. It's very lively, but it's and it's not super long. Um, but I mean, it doesn't appear super long, but it's actually three seconds here. But it doesn't sound to the ear as long. It sound it registers as pretty quick and 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 nice and aggressive. But it's actually quite long. Um, let's see here. Love that one. Uh, large chamber. I use this one a lot on vocals. This one has quite a long pre-delay, um, compared to some of the others. Uh, it's got about 25 milliseconds on the actual plugin, and then it's got 60 on the, on this, uh, default here. but it sounds great on vocals. Not as good on percussive instruments like that, but great on vocals. This is ambient verb. It's like, what, eight seconds, something like that? Six and a half, very long. Now we move into delay land. So here's my short slap mono. 
Very simple slap delay. Same type thing, but stereo. A little bit longer. Um, this one's about, uh, the short slap mono is about 88 milliseconds. This one is a little bit longer. Um, Actually, shorten that just a hair. So it's like ninety something milliseconds on the left, and and a hundred something milliseconds on the right, like a hundred and five or something. It's a little hard because this left right offset. Uh, so I think that makes that like eighty two on the left, and and a hundred and nine on the right, or something like that. So they're not the same, they're different. It's a dual echo setup. Um, let's see, this is Dirty Tape Slap. So I'm using uh, J37 for this, the Waves J37. And uh, it's set up fairly distorted. Somewhat dark. About 128 milliseconds. Uh, I'm going to actually drop that to 120. One twenty two. How about that? Uh, we have mono tape delay. We have stereo tape delay. Okay, I could probably bump up my mono tape delay. That seems a little bit low. And probably turn down my stereo tape delay. Again, I want these to all kind of come across around the same level. In this case, uh, they're all hitting around negative 16 in this particular demo. You know, within a couple dB of each other. Here's my long analog delay. It's very long. Here's my first modulated delay. Okay, that's a cool one. And then are some of our new ones? Uh, let's see. Now we'll go back. So we have Echo Rec sixteenths. Super cool. We have our Echo Rec dotted. Let me actually time align this correctly here. Oh, this session is actually at 100. So see how it locks automatically to the correct tempo? It's really great. Um, and then here's the dual delay that we created here tonight on the, uh, on the YouTube stream. Okay, so this is a uh, space echo algorithm. We have a quarter note on the left and an eighth, dotted eighth on the right. Uh, I've adjusted the EQ a little bit and the some of the modulation and a touch of diffusion. Of 
Great sound. Very happy with how that came out. Uh, then we have our space echo, which is actually kind of more of a reverb. Right? It kind of lends itself to almost more of a reverb-esque kind of sound. And then we have our doubler. Which I just like this Waves doubler. This is like a 20-year-old plug-in. And I love it. It does what it does, and I really, really like it. Um, the uh, micro shift from uh, Sound Toys is also great. So when I open up a session, it defaults to 44 tracks. Um, I have 44 tracks made, right? I have all these effects, 24 tracks, my master bus, I have a mono and a stereo track. I have these groups, I have my all vocals, all music, all effects bus, I have my print bus, and my print track. So I'm just going to rename to that. Um, all of my faders are at zero. They start all at zero. Um, I don't have anything sent to anything by default, other than my print bus is, sent, is being recorded on my print track. My all my vocals go to my vocal bus. My you know music stuff goes to music bus. Affects the effects bus. But like I don't send any tracks. Like uh, I don't send my lead vocal into my uh, drum bus or anything like that. Like I let a lot of those decisions be. Now the only other thing that's really here in the template is that in my on my individual buses I have a couple of effects. Not many, but a couple that I know I'm going to use. Um, and I'm going to add some of these here in a minute. So, for example, on bass, basically, on first of all, on all of these bus tracks, I have FabFilter Pro Q3 as the default plugin. Um, now, again, I'm big on this sort of thing. By default, this is my FabFilter setting. When you open up FabFilter, I have this set as my default preset. A lot of people, I think foolishly, leave their FabFilter empty when they open it up. Okay, why keep it empty if you're gonna do the same type of move hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times? So my default preset is this, which has a low band, a low sh like a low shelf like this. It's got a high shelf here. Um, I've got a couple of bells, and uh, this one is a more square kind of bell, um, 24 dB per octave, and this is sort of a wide, uh, like 5, 6K bell. And then this is like a Poltec style, like a uh, pretty bright, uh, wide bell, Poltec or Bax kind of thing. Uh, I have a sharp low mid band like this. I have a wider mid band like that. And I have a pretty normal, like Neve sized band like this. All of these are generally inspired by a Neve or SSL style band. Uh, my shelves are inspired by, inspired by Neve band. Uh, and this, these two mid bands are both inspired by Neve shapes, um, but uh, this, these bells are unique to FabFilter, the yellow and red, and then uh, these two bells are inspired by Poltec. Now, by default, I have a high pass filter and a low pass filter on. Okay, so when I open up this plugin, chances are you're going to high pass something. So you open up the plugin, and boom, done. If you need to low pass it as well, which often you do, done. If you don't need to low pass it, you can just drag this all the way to the right or just delete it, right? Um, but like I said, my default setting has these set up. I highly recommend if you use an EQ like this to have a default band thing kind of set up. Um, it, it will save your life. So that is on every single bus. Um, on my vocal bus, chances are I'm going to need a de -esser. So I'm going to actually go ahead and put that on. Um, and I usually have my default preset uh, saved to about like this. 3.5K all the way to 20K. Split band, single vocal. And I set my uh, range to 9 dB. On uh, my uh, threshold, usually around negative 22. And I do have the look ahead on. Um, but again, I'm going to bypass these. I leave the plugins on the track, but they're bypassed. 
Um, chances are I'm going to need a multiband on my, on my backing vocals. I'm going to leave that empty because I don't really know what I need yet. But uh, on my acoustic guitars, I have uh, Neve 33609. I really like this on acoustics. I also like the API 2500. On electrics, I generally don't do any compression, so usually all I need on that is an EQ. Uh, keys, I really like the 1176 on, on keys. Um, synths, I usually don't do a lot of compression on those, but if I were to do, it probably would be 1176 as well. Um, just taming it, you know what I mean? Just taming it a little bit. Um, nothing on the percussion bus, but if I were to do something on that, it probably would be an 1176 as well. Again, something just tapping, just a DB or two. Doesn't have to be anything crazy. On my drum bus, I usually have, uh, the API 2500. Um, I kind of go back and forth on where I like the headroom knob. I kind of like it here for now. Uh, which is about 2 o'clock, but I kind of go back and forth, like I said. Sometimes I like it a little bit more in the middle. I don't know. And then I also have the Ac Acme Opticom uh, set up for a parallel drum kind of crush thing. You can see here, I don't know if my tip will come up, it's 10% wet. So it's very low mixed. Very low mixed. It's just enough to add some crunch and grit. On my bass, again, I have Fab Filter, but then I have uh, Auto-Tune. Oddly enough, I use auto tune on my bass. Um, if it's an electric bass, if it's an a uh, if it's a synth bass, it's usually already pretty close in tune, or it's purposely supposed to be out of tune. Um, if that makes sense. And uh, I set it to the baritone or bass mode, and uh, sometimes the instrument mode works a little better. But uh, this will help to correct any intonation issues on an electric bass guitar. Um, it really seems to help a lot with that. Uh, and then I have a sidechain compressor set up because I often will sidechain my kick into my bass. Now, this one is already set up, ready to go. Um, the sidechain is activated. All I have to do is turn on the plugin. And I'm ready to, I don't have to, I add this plugin to my bass all the time, so why not just put it in the, uh, in the template, right? Um, again, with these plugins bypassed, um, I actually don't need to. They're not taking any of my UAD processing power. Like if I open up my UAD window, uh, 1%. You know what I mean? Just from them being in the session and from me having like that UAD, the, the EMT, um, the EMT reverb up, 1%, right? Um, all this stuff is not using anything until I turn it on. So I keep all these plugins. I don't keep my, uh, I don't keep my uh, effects bypassed, but I keep my my actual like compression and, and EQ bypassed. Um, and I keep my master bus bypassed. Uh, so other than that, that's pretty much it. Um, that is pretty much my effects template. And like I said, I end up saving this as a template. Uh, and the only other thing I have to remember to do when I'm saving a template is uh, get rid of any audio I brought in um, to demonstrate the template to myself or to others because it will save that audio in the template, which is good and bad. That's kind of annoying. It's kind of stupid. Like, why would you really need to do that? But other times it's like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I also need to make sure and make sure that my tempo is uh, 120 BPM by default. So we've got about seven minutes left. Um, I know there are two of you still here. Uh, are there any questions or anything that I need to explain that I did not explain uh, that would be helpful for you, uh, for me to explain on templates, setting up uh, sessions like this, and so on? I'm more than happy to answer any questions. While we got, I'm just going to stream for another five or six minutes. So if you guys have any questions before I go about templates, let me know. Um, hopefully this has been... Very helpful. I'm just going to double check some things, make sure I don't have any, like, stuff enabled. Okay, see, like, I left this send enabled. Need to make sure that that's, that's not enabled, you know? Need to make sure I didn't leave anything like that. Ah, okay, the space echo. Need to disable this.
I need to make sure I don't have any weird EQs enabled. Nope. So when you save the template, you need to make a backup in case you format your PC. Yeah, so I back up everything religiously. Um, I use a program called Acronis, and it backs up my computer every single night. Uh, and when I say my computer, I mean my entire computer every single night. Um, so, yeah, it's backed up. <laughs> uh, but usually what I do is I actually carry around a flash drive that has a lot of that stuff on it. Like, it has my templates... Um, it has my key commands, it has my preferences, uh, it has a lot of my, like, organizational things, so if I ever have to get in a bind, I can pretty much just open up that flash drive, and it has all the immediate stuff that I need. Um, but I keep a backup folder, uh, that is pretty ridiculous. So, like, if I go to backup, this is my backup folder, okay, and this backup folder contains basically everything I need. Um, folder number one here is Nuendo and Cubase, and folder number two is Nuendo program files and data. Nuendo and Cubase folder, so this has Nuendo 3, Nuendo 4, Nuendo, Nuendo 6, Nuendo 7, Nuendo 8, Nuendo 8.2, uh, Cubase 9. So these are all the things that I've owned, okay? Uh, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 8.2. Um, and then, uh, here's my program files and data, so here's my key commands, things like that. Uh, and then, like, my plugins. This has all of my plugins, um, which this is not loading all. I have many more folders than this. Give it a second. Uh, what was your question, and what is the difference between saving a template uh, or as a project uh, name template.cpr? Um, not really any difference. Yeah, here's all my plugins. Um, I got some more over here, too. Uh, there's not really any difference. Uh, the main difference is that um, when you open up Nuendo and do new project, I have it set to open up and prompt for templates. So this will open up from your templates folder, so you don't have to go searching for it every time, like open up default project. Now some people, when they open up Nuendo, they will open it by opening a project. Okay, Some people do that. I don't do that. Uh, and some people use the hub, the uh, Steinberg hub. I don't use the hub either. Um, so typically what happens is I open Nuendo, and I have a black screen, or a, in this case a dark blue screen, and I do File, New Project, and it opens up my template window, which I will click like this so you can see. I don't know if it'll let me do that. Yeah, so it opens up my template window, so now I can pick a template. So that's why I do that. That's really the only difference, though. It, it, it really is. Like, for example, if you're on a PC, uh, the way to get to that is to go to your application data folder, uh, which is in your users folder, and then you'd go to Nuendo, and then you go to project templates, and you can see that they are saved here as, in my case, NPR files, or in your case, CPR files, uh, if you're on Cubase. Um, so they are indeed saved as those folders. Um, on a PC, that's C slash users slash uh, your username slash app data slash roaming slash Steinberg slash Nuendo, uh, your version slash project templates. And that would save in that folder literally just Cubase or Nuendo project files. That's all they are. So you can delete them. That's how you go and delete them or modify them or whatever if you need to. So, yeah. But I also have like the save template, save as template. And I can uh, add different. Um, I can add different uh, tags or things like that, or I can make folders. I can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's really handy. I really like the. Uh, I really like the template thing that they have in Nuendo now. Um, any other questions before we call it a night? I'm gonna leave this video up on the YouTube too, so you guys will be able to watch this if you need to. I appreciate you guys sticking around, and uh, hopefully you guys learned something. Maybe you got some ideas. Maybe you got some things for your own templates. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to mention here.
I think that is about it. Cool. All right. Uh, thanks for watching. I'm going to leave this video up on the YouTube so you can watch uh, on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash recording lounge. Make sure to check out recordingloungepodcast.com. Uh, I'm going to try to make a blog post about this as well. Um, so, yeah. Uh, 